right, welcome everybody to Dave Cooper Live, where we bring you the industry leaders together with the people, the products, and the processes to help them build it better. And today is no different. From the Everglades to unmovable deadlines, see how this prefab elevator company handles construction demands. Everything from extreme climates to extreme events. Please welcome Allison Allgaier of Phoenix Modular Elevator as she shares with us how much modular elevators have in common with the Grand Prix. That's right. The Grand Prix. Just like Formula One delivers on cutting edge technology and tactical complexity, today's conversation will cover the engineering feats, technological innovation, and customization provided by Phoenix Modular Elevator. But first, as always, we need to have a word from our sponsors. Stream Modular, the only logistics company you need to transport your mods, pods, and panels. Our friends at Stream Modular are investing $50 million over the next 25 years to build the technology, solutions, and trailers needed to handle and transport the projects of today and meet the demands of tomorrow. Reach out to their team at StreamModular.com to discuss your next project. CombiLift is the largest global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers, a leader in long load handling solutions offering a free warehouse and site optimization design service. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes and from every industry maximize the capacity, safety, and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. A big thank you to Paul Short and the team at CombiLift for helping us all to build it better. Visit them at combilift.com. Brave Control Solutions, where offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry empowered by CAD to Fab and turnkey solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembly, kitting, and storage. Learn more at thinkbrave.com. All right, again, thank you to all of our sponsors that are out there and also for a construct who is our newest supporting member of the Dave Cooper Live Show. Stay tuned for more details on that. Now, modular elevators. Let's get into it and let's bring Allison on to the show. Allison, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Dave. Good to be here. Listen, Allison, we ran into each other at World of Modular in sunny Florida just recently. Uh, and one of the things that's really never crossed our uh, studio here has been modular elevator systems. I've heard about them. I've talked about them with people out there and around and about, but I've never met somebody who was actually a part of building them, delivering them and helping others build it better. So I'm super excited about today's conversation. But first, Allison, we do with everybody on this show. We want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital or we will have one of your eight siblings on the show. That's right. One of eight. And I'm sure that somebody's going to spill the beans. But the floor is yours. You got two minutes. All right. Thanks. Uh, well, I was born in New Jersey, grew up in San Diego, uh, went to school, worked in the world of finance and healthcare. Decided that wasn't my passion. Went back to school and got an MBA so I could move into operations. I knew I wanted to run a factory. Worked for uh, Alcoa for about eight years and realized I wanted to run a smaller company where I could make a difference and move and, and just be a little bit more nimble. And so I cast about looking for a small manufacturing company to buy and chanced upon a company that had invented modular elevators back in the mid-90s after the ADA came out but had closed their doors about a year earlier. So I acquired those assets, um, hired back a lot of the people. This was 2009, so in the middle of a recession, a whole bunch of people were still unemployed, and hired back a core group of people and started it back up again and rebranded it as Phoenix Modular Elevator, and we've grown it from there. 
Yeah, I mean, and have you ever grown it? I mean, I think it's such an awesome, awesome story, you know, to actually uh, bring a company from the grave, so to speak, as we like to say, right? You actually took something and you built it to something magnificent. What? How, how big is the company today? We have about 40 employees. Um, currently, we can make about an elevator a week. Uh, we have a 40,000 square foot facility, which we built new about six years ago. Um, but we have capacity. We could grow it further um, by adding shifts and, and even adding people on our day shifts. And, and your, your manufacturing facility is in Phoenix, correct? No, it's in Southern Illinois. We're Southern. Phoenix, not You're, Phoenix City. Love it. Got it. And, and what is the territory that you, that you cover? We ship elevators and install them throughout the U.S. and Canada as well. From the U.S. and Canada as well. Perfect. Perfect. We have installations. I think our installed base is about 37 different states and four Canadian provinces. And how many provinces? Four. And four provinces. Right, right. So Phoenix refers to rising from the ashes. Is that what yeah. it means? Love because it. We, re we resurrected the former company and brought it back to life. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So let's get into modular elevators. Uh, you know, They've been around for, for quite some time, like you said. Um, who are you serving right now? What, what, are, what, are, what are the elevators, and then who are you serving? Well, when the elevators were first invented by three smart guys who lived in Mount Vernon, Illinois, the concept was the ADA had just been passed, and so they thought everybody's going to need to add elevators to their buildings. So they came up with this concept of a box that could be put onto the outside of the building. And so that's where it started, so a lot of retrofits. Um, but then they discovered, this was before my involvement, um, the commercial modular construction business, um, in particular in California, it was really booming. And so they did a lot of business with California schools, as well as lots of other types of buildings. So when we restarted them up, it was kind of a 50-50 retrofits and commercial modular construction. But it has grown over the last 15 years to really be partnered with those are still very good partners of us and very good business propositions and value propositions for those kind of customers mm -hmm. but we have seen a lot more customers of new stick built construction that just want and need a different solution for their elevators I love it. And for those of you just joining us, we are talking about Phoenix uh, uh, elevators, and we are going to get into some uh, slideshows here where we're going to show some videos, some pictures, some of the manufacturing. So if you're just joining us, please welcome Allison in the comments. Uh, we always love to hear from you out there. So Allison, let's let's do kind of a let's do a definition of elevators. What kind of elevators are these? Right? Because there's hydraulic, there's traction. What are we looking at here? Are you do you do both? We will do anything. Um, I like to say the hoist weight. So a modular elevator is the shaft with all the elevator components in it, including the car. That shaft is just a box. We can make the box any size you want. The car is just a box. We can put, we can make it look however you want, dress it up however you want. And then the equipment that moves it, we just install it in the shaft. So most of what we do is hydraulic. Uh, we tend to be kind of low to mid rise and that is the better price point. Um, Hydraulic is a better, a more cost-effective drive system for that. Um, okay. But we also do traction elevators um, when you get up into higher rises. Traction. So we've done, you, we've done clean roomless versions of both as well, and we even did one freight elevator that we put in Nova Scotia. Oh, no kidding. Great. So when you say uh, mid-rise, how many story? like what's your, what's your sweet spot as far as what you like to do versus how high you can go? We do a lot of two, three, and four stop elevators, which fit into a single tower. Beyond that, we stack towers, and so we can go six, seven. The, the tallest we've built is nine stops. Um, we've done three-piece towers. Wow. Uh, so our, our sweet spot, most of what we do is in that lower range um, in the single-piece towers because there's a lot of demand for that. But we can do the other stuff and commonly do it as well. So it sounds like this is perfect for like healthcare, educational buildings, you know, things that are typically four stories and below. Mm -hmm. and Office, multifamily, parking garages, stadiums. Right. Yeah, really the whole gamut of construction type. I mean, to me, regardless of even modular or offsite construction, this seems like the way to go just for a regular construction, no? Absolutely. Um, and actually, one of the, well, it solved the pain point that when I started in this didn't really realize that there was, and that is that the elevator trade 
is usually the least favorite trade of general contractors on the job site. Um, they cause delays, they're prima donnas, they, they just come in and want to do things their way and you know, like to charge you change orders and remobilizations and everything like that. More complicated in um, kind of coordinating all the trades. And so we have customers now that just don't want to work with them anymore. And like the modular, we come in, we're faster, we're easier, we get along with you, we inform you, we don't try to find ways to charge you more money. Who, who do you work with when it comes to the modular companies? Is it the general contractor? Is it the modular manufacturer, the architects? Typically, well, the architects would be the ones that specify us. Our contracts are usually with the general contractors. They may or may not have had a hand in the decision of, of specking us or not. Um, right. Some GCs do, and they buy directly from us, and others buy from us because the architect told them to. Um, modular manufacturers will usually be in the in the in the role of recommending you know they're, they're providing the boxes and the the customer or the developer says what about the elevator and they say well go talk to phoenix right and and i'm assuming what you do is you work closely with the modular manufacturers engineers to make sure structurally what needs to be where is where it is when it comes to the job site and do you go in before the mods or do you go in after the mods Either one. So to your first question, yes, we work very closely on the design side. It could be with the manufacturers or with the architects to make sure that our elevator is incorporated correctly. And then there's there's four different touch points at the pit, at the doors, at the roof, and, and the walls. And so we work with them on make sure you've got solutions for this and you know how to integrate it with your building. We do that with modular or stick built. We kind of do a whole design scrub and we look at their drawings and tell them things, tell them the things that they don't know to ask and work through that. As far as the sequence, um, yeah. we just have the box. The elevator doesn't care when it gets set. And so it could go at the beginning and then the building is built around it. It can drop in at the end. Um, if it's on the outside of the building, it typically comes at the end. So it really depends on the on the craning process and the, and the building process when they want to put us in. So the coordination side of this is huge then, right? When when your product shows up to a job site where and I would imagine crane placement, everything has to be just right for this to be lowered in from above or even put in uh, beforehand. Tell me about the on-site. Who's installing this? Is it the set crew from your company or is it the set crew of the modular company? Who's actually in charge of uh, putting these in place once they arrive? We always have an elevator mechanic on site. Typically the GC will supply the crane and the rigging, but we'll help rig it and we'll make sure it's leveled and plumb and communicate with the crane operator to make sure it's set right. We're gonna get into showing some of the photos, some of the factories here in one second, but I do have a question based on something you said earlier about, you know, elevator folks being prima donnas or, or you know, like they, whatever that word was that you use, why is the elevator industry so hard? Well, you need to ask them. I don't know if they got up on the wrong side of the bed or something was in their Wheaties in the morning. Um, it, it's a trade. I mean, it's historically, it's a heavily union trade. And so there's just that aspect of, you know, we're the best and you need to work around us. There's not a lot of elevator companies, especially the majors. And so I think they've been able to, you know, and they're specified in your, you know, so if they're drawn into it, then the GC is stuck using them. And right. so they can't necessarily bid it out. And so they don't have to be as customer focused or friendly or responsive. Um, I don't know. Those are my guesses, just how that culture is developed. Well, yeah, I mean, I would imagine so. And a lot of the elevator companies are union as well. Are you a union based shop? We are not union. Mm -hmm. um, most of our installers are not, but some of our installers are. Um, so there's, some unions hate us. Uh, some union members or union divisions um, yeah. don't think we're people because we're stealing jobs or whatever. And we say, no, we're making the on-site guy's job easier. I do not know a single elevator mechanic that loves hanging rails in the field. Those things weigh 350 pounds and you're swinging them from chains and right. climbing on scaffolds and ladders. And like, let us do that work. Yeah, for sure. And I don't see how anybody's actually uh, like taking or losing jobs because the reality is somebody's putting it in, whether whether it's on the union side or on the, you know, in the independent side. But that's a conversation for another show. Let's get into showing uh, some of the uh, product photos you sent and then we can go through. There's some videos as well. Is uh, this a good time? Yeah, let's show talk a little bit about our process. Perfect. 
So we basically, maybe there's some people out there thinking, how do you build a really tall elevator in a factory? Like how tall is that factory? We just take the whole traditional stick construction and literally turn it on its side. So our elevators are all manufactured horizontally. This is um, one that's getting drywalled currently. So we have a structural bay, it's all welded up um, horizontally when it's multi-piece towers, we actually build the first one, slide it down, build the second one onto it. And we built, you know, where the third piece, it's all one piece. And then we just break it apart when we ship. So that means that it is plumb all the way up and all the way down. Um, everything's aligned and so on. Then we drywall it. You see this picture here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's just drywall. You see it's, our jobs are so easy and ergonomic that people sit down on the job, apparently. Um, <laughs> to the and we also, if you go to the next picture, uh, we have some unique equipment, again, to help with that safety and the ergonomics. That blue contraption right there is our tower turner. So it hooks up when we're enclosing the elevator, um, hooks up in four corners and rotates the elevator so that we never have to work overhead. We don't have to climb on top of the tower. We bring the walls, the empty walls to the drywallers, and then they put it on the floor and on the walls, basically on side walls. So that, that flips it like a pancake. Like a, well, it but just kind of turns it around to whatever they need. It's a rotisserie. Rotisserie. There's it. That's a better, it's a rotisserie. I got it. That's awesome. Um, and then the next picture, this is a video that shows it's our process called stabbing the cab. So the cab is assembled upright. So it, it's fully assembled. And then we tip it forward with the crane. We need to make it horizontal because the, the shaft is horizontal. Right. And so we, we tip it down there and slide it right onto the rails in the elevator hoist way. So you can. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit because it is a two minute, but I want to show yep. what's going on here. So it tips over and then that hoist is actually going to put it right inside the shaft that you just built. Yep. And there's some guide rails. People who know about elevators are watching that guide shoe go up to the guide rail. Yep. Um, you can kind of see that little blue thing and it slides right on because the sling is built on a jig and we use a jig to um, get that. There you see it up in that upper right hand corner. And we use a jig to align the rails and make sure they're right. So it marries it perfectly. They've been built in two different places. And then it just slides in, slides on the rails. We slide all the way up. We check clearances. There's a whole lot of code required clearances between sills, make sure the door equipment um, is aligned and we'll open the doors and push it all the way up and all the way down and, and then lock it down for shipping. That's great. So we've developed, had, had to develop because elevators are not made to be horizontal in, in shipping and transport and all of that. So we've, created all manner of, of brackets and cribbing and things like that to make sure they can ship safely to East Coast, West Coast, Alaska, far Northern Manitoba, places like that and not be damaged. What What is the length of a section that you're comfortable with when shipping? Can you do multiple sections together or is it always a predefined length, width and height? We can ship about 50 feet um, over the road. I mean, you can do longer loads than that. We've sometimes crept a little over that. Um, right. But if it's if it's much more than that, then we'll chop it into two pieces or three pieces. The how where we chop it depends on where the door is, and there's some math around. You know, rails are 16 feet long, and so where's the best place to chop each tower? But basically, between the floors, they're up to four, up to 50 feet. Understood. Perfect. Moving on, we got this uh, project here. Yes. Yeah, so this is a project in the Everglades. This is like the very tip of the Everglades past where there's hotels or anything. And it's in the national park and they decided to put a restaurant there, but because there's hurricanes, it all had to be up on stilts. Well, it's up on stilts. So you got to have elevators. Um, so fine, we can do elevators, but then the elevators, you know, that bottom half can get hurricane and flood. Right. And so um, we kind of did a whole lot of back and forth with them. And they said, how about you just galvanize the whole tower? So we bought galvanized structural steel and welded that up into this tower. Um, and then some other waterproofing things that we did as well, just to make sure like up to about 13 feet. So if a flood comes through and then the water goes out, you know, you got to repair drywall and obviously there's repairs to do, but it won't right. rust out the whole elevator and, you know, make you tear it all up. So Allison, tell I mean, like the Everglades, right? It's remote, it's hot, there's a humid climate. So, I mean, that's one half, of, you know, one, one part of the United States, but let's say we're going up towards Buffalo or Canada where it's cold and you don't have the same humidity. Does that, does, does the climate zones affect the elevators and the, what you take into account when you're designing and building and where it's going? How important is that? Yeah. So if it's somewhere that's cold, we'll often put insulation on it. 
um, are in it. We actually put it in the walls. Sometimes they add insulation on site as well. There's equipment, um, tank heaters that we do to put to keep the tanks uh, to keep the oil hotter so that it maintains low enough viscosity to, to be flowing. Um, so it's really within the elevator yeah. equipment. There's not a whole lot besides insulation we do on the shaft um, for that. Got it. Got it. Just the back side of the same building? Yeah, there were actually two elevators we supplied. So that's just showing the finished product. Um, they do their bright colors in Florida. So our elevators were purple. And you can see the elevator over on the right. You can see the door kind of in that shadow. Yeah, perfect. So, beautiful I mean, restaurant. Beautiful. How was the how was the food more importantly? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> Our guys never ate there. They had to bring like picnic lunches because nothing was open yet. Right. So. I'm assuming this is the manufacturing facility. I see two lines running. Is that? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the manufacturing facility? How many lines? How many shifts? All that. Um, yeah, we are currently just one shift, um, but we can go too wide and actually too high, not in the manufacturing. But this is a picture right before we shipped a very large job to San Diego, where our factory was basically full. Yeah. Um, there were four three-piece traction elevators, and we finished them and then had to stack and stage them because we were installing them all at the same time. But we can't, we couldn't make all four at the same time. So they're all stacked up there. Plus, there were some other hydraulic elevators that were kind of going around them and. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that filled up our forty thousand square foot facility. And and is is most of the facility is it manual? Do you have any automated processes in the manufacturing facility? We don't. It is it is manual process. We've looked into we looked into robots for yep. drywall, um, but because it's hard to get a robot inside the hoistway, and and do, you know someone wanted like a million dollars to just have one that could do the outside, and that didn't really cost justify. Our drywall crews are pretty pretty efficient. I bet. I bet. So here you go. Look, it looks like we're standing one up. Can I play this video? Yes. So this is UC San Diego um, Hillcrest and Medical Center. There's a parking garage you can see there. It's nine stories. Um, four of them are underground. And this is uh, the biggest modular elevator project that we've done and the biggest one in the world as far as we know. We don't, I don't know anyone else that does um, this. So this is a it set over the course of 10 days. There was four different set days and then days off in between um, to get some welding into the building. So you can see they're craned up into place. That's when they go vertical. They're dropped down into the hole. That one side doesn't have drywall on it because these were duplex elevators. And so in between them, we didn't need drywall. So a little cost savings thing that we do. This so when you say a du time. just to clarify, when you say a duplex elevator, there's two side by side. There you go. Yeah, you now I see it. Yep. So here, here we are kind of threading the needle, um, going all the way down. This was actually fourplex. There were two on one side, two on the other side facing each other. Um, no kidding. I mean, look at how precise that is. I mean, you're only inches away from, you know, that concrete coming down each level. Uh, I mean, how much tolerance do they have to move that around inside there? Well, we always tell them when they are, are planning, when we're dropping it in a hole, to allow three inches on all sides because there's an entrance frame that sticks out the front. You know, they might not exactly be level on the crane because the weight isn't necessarily a 50, 50 distribution. Um, so that was, that was in that range. Uh, but there's some very skilled iron workers that are guiding it down. Yeah, for sure. So That's this is, great. this is the second tower. Then we set um, four of these in a, in a day after we, they welded all the bottom ones in um, and they just bolt to the top. So they bring it down and there's actually eight points where these intersect, there's four corners that bolt together and then two sets of rails. And so it, it just comes down and they all slide right together because they were that way in the factory. And so there's not a, gee, we have to line something or bang something this way and that. It's just kind of nestling right. down, bolting them all together and bring in the next one. Yeah, so, look at that. That's that's amazing. And that's uh, that's that's one day's worth of work, not even. Yes, on, these, on the second tower. So the first two... <clears throat> They, they welded some embeds in the pit, so it was a little more complicated. So we did two of the T1s one day, then two of the T1s. But yeah, all the T2s went in one day, and then all the T3s uh, went in the last day of the set. And so when they're bringing these down, I would imagine the very base where these are setting is one of the most critical points to make sure that it is 100% level. Uh, is there any flexibility for going up and down an inch or what have you, or, or is it precise every time? 
Well, we do allow for about an inch. So our, our base plates, we have base plates that bolt into the pit typically. This was a unique thing. They did some different engineering on it. Um, but we make our, our pit area of that steel an inch less deep than the pit, an inch shallower. Okay. So if the pit's off a little bit, it, lives, it gives us room to, to shim up and down and kind of level that. And these are the top pieces. And you can, you, you can see like a regular door at the very top. Um, and that is the machine room. So got it. So when you say the machine room, that's the that's everything that is is managing the hydraulics or whatever this elevator is to pull it up and down. So it's all self enclosed. There doesn't have to be a different room to, for the controllers. Well, in this case, they did do a separate room of controllers just over the other side of the parking garage. And then mm -hmm. all four controllers were in there and then ran the wires in. Got it. But they can also be all self contained in that. How does this work in regards to working with a modular company or a panelized company or any company when it comes to permits, logistics, transportation? Um, do you got to pull your own permits or is it part of the job? How does it work? Well, a modular elevator, interestingly, is two different codes that intersect. One is the building code, which governs the shaft, and the other is elevator code, which governs everything inside of it. And so the building, per we, we, um, we engineer the hoistway and then okay. we send provide stamp structural drawings and calculations, and then those are used for the building permit side. All of the elevator equipment in every state, um, there's no permit, you, well, there's a permit you do in advance to, to install it, but it is all inspected on site. And so once it's put in and it's running and tested and adjusted, then the local elevator inspector comes and does that inspection. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's take a quick little break here, Allison. Just stay right there with me. If you're just joining us, everybody, we are talking about Phoenix elevators. That's right. Modular elevator systems. So make sure you give us a uh, some love out there. Hit that like button and please put your questions and comments in the comment section. And we'll have a chance to get to you here at the very, very end of the show. And also, I want to say a quick shout out to the Unico systems for all of their support of Dave Cooper Live. If you want high velocity, velocity duct systems that have the best, and I say the best energy efficiency ever for your modular project or your on-site project, hey, give them a check out and see what they're up to. We have to support everybody that supports us because it allows us to bring you all of these innovative conversations to help you build it better. So again, thank you to the Unico Systems for being a part of the Dave Cooper Live Show. All right, let's get back into it. We got a lot more to get through here. Allison. All right, you're wowing me now. Now I'm in the wow mood. Uh, and, and I think this is going to be a lot of fun to keep walking through this process and really helping people understand the benefits and the value and the cost savings that comes with doing it this way as well. So let's keep getting uh, through some of the logistics and transportation side of this. Do you have to pull special permits to take a 50 foot long elevator down the highway? Um, the trucking companies that we hire take care of the permits. So yep. occasionally, they are, well, pretty commonly they're permitted loads because they're beyond the eight foot wide. Um, okay. Sometimes they're drop decks and a little bit extra high and extra wide. Uh, but our trucking companies do take care of all that. Perfect. Perfect. What are we looking at in this picture? That's the finished UCSD parking garage. So that's the one with the four traction elevators. You can see the interior there. They finished them out real nicely. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Yep. Yep. There they are. Beautiful. And that all came from the manufacturer. How about the chrome or those add-on pieces once it's in place? No, the doors are ours. The doors and those door frames yep. were supplied with us. Um, but they put that little extra thing in the center that, that stained. Oh, no. yeah. Oh, sorry. Added right. No, they added some of that. I haven't been back. I was there for the set. I wasn't there for the final picture. So I'm, I'm looking at the details too. All right. Beautiful. What are we looking at here? This picture is a little small. I'm going to try and blow it up so people can see it. Not sure why it's coming up that yeah, way. Yeah, Formula One race in Las Vegas. So they approached us in March and said, yep. we are building, it was a company called In Production. They said, we are building some luxury grandstands for the Grand Prix race in Las Vegas in the fall. We want to wow them with really nice bathrooms and really nice elevators. So what can you do for us? Because usually they just use uh, wheelchair lifts, yep. which are kind of clunky and slow. So we produced seven very nice, fancy looking elevators, three-stop elevators. They had to come up with a an innovative pit design. Every elevator needs a pit because there's equipment down there. Yep. But um, Las Vegas, because this was all temporary, wouldn't let them dig holes in the ground and pour concrete. So they made above ground pits out of steel that they engineered 
um, bolted our towers to them, and then they had them strapped to the parking lots where they were, basically. So this was a very wow. quick, uh, we delivered the first in mid-September and started on the install of them, getting them tested and adjusted. These are machine roomless hydraulic elevators. So all the equipment was, even the machine room equipment was in the side of the hoistway. Uh, we had a very, very busy day. It was the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before the race where we inspected seven elevators and 10 vertical platform lifts in three days. Um, wow. That killed our mechanics. But local inspectors are just fantastic. It was very accommodating of this event. Um, and our guys just worked their tails off. So, I mean, the Grand Prix. So have you? how many Grand Prix have you done so far? We supplied one to the Miami one a couple of years ago. Yep. And that's how the production found out about us. And we've done this. And after the race was over, we went back in, took the elevators down, wrapped them back up, and they're in storage about 15 miles away. And so come November, we'll put them back in again. So, you know, the Las Vegas event just happened. And I, if I'm correct on this, my guess is you were the last one to the table and they needed everything tomorrow and super fast. And I see you smiling. So, I mean, talk to me a little bit about the deadlines, deadlines constraints you know, inspections, because you said the inspectors were really great helping pull all this together. Um, dive in, I, I'd really like to dive into to this project a little bit because it's not permanent. It's not, but the elevator actually is no different. We made the elevator the same way. It's just the beauty of how we install them. You bolt them down, right. you can unbolt them. Um, so we put all the brackets back in so we can tip it back down horizontally again and really just reverse that process. And, and will you reuse these for the next Grand Prix or will they go to a yeah. different project? Year after year. No. They've also talked about potentially putting them into other places as well because they provide temporary grandstands all over the country. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? So you basically modularize the system for the Grand Prix to use in different parts of the country is what I'm hearing. Yeah, absolutely. How cool is that? Very cool. It's a lot of fun to be a part of. Yeah, you know what, and it's and it's more sustainable and greener than you know Hollywood building a whole set and then tearing it all down and throwing it in the garbage, right? I mean, yeah, that, exactly. that is uh, pretty cool. So I'm assuming this is just another view of the uh, setup. Yeah, just different views of yeah, different. One of the seven. One of the seven. So perfect, perfect. Talk to me about some of the other projects that you have been working on. Uh, do you work with DPR and some of the other bigger trades out there that are in the modular space, the bath pod space, all that? Yeah, the UCSD parking garage project actually was with DPR. And we have two other projects that we just installed a week or two ago with them. Um, we have mid-sized GCs all over the Midwest, a lot of modular, modular builders um, that are repeat customers. We still do a lot of schools in California. I mean, we've talked about some of the fun, glamorous ones. Right. A whole lot of bread and butter of just people building buildings, um, military bases needing office buildings, uh, schools, hotels, right. hospitals, um, all of that. That that all all look at, at nice. Um, they have customization in their own way. They may not have super deadlines, um, drop dead deadlines, but we have other deadlines. I'm thinking we supplied yeah. one. Uh, it was last summer to the Augusta National Golf Course that they have like this 100 day construction window right. when their golf course is shut down and then everything's got to be back up for it was term in October, I believe, that we worked around there. There's a one that we're shipping next Tuesday that's going down to Miami. No There's a, a cricket, the, the Broward County cricket is putting in a, a nice luxury stadium. I didn't know there was a lot of cricket in Florida. Um, but they've yeah. got a big tournament coming on May 31st. And so they've got to have things by then. There's so. a cricket stadium going in Florida. I never, never even heard of a cricket stadium in the United States. So that's kind of cool. Why not? Why not? Indeed. Yeah. Why not? So what about, what about certain like uh, states, you know, like California or any other state, do you run into where certain states have special requirements based on the state itself or even the type of construction, whether it be a residential unit or a hospital or a school? Every state governs its own construction. So they've got their own rules. They have adopted their own year of the elevator code, just like their own year of the um, building code. Yeah. They often make amendments to states like California and Massachusetts decide that the standard code isn't good enough for them. And so they add stuff to it. And so anytime we go into a new place, into a new state that we haven't been before, we will look up their codes. We will contact the officials. 
make sure we've got any any unique requirements taken care of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Maine says every elevator has to have two hour drywall on it. So we can't do one hour drywall. So we just find out stuff like that and then make sure that we're um, complying with that. That's and good. do the inspections happen in the manufacturing facility or do they inspect everything you've done on site? All the elevators are inspected on site. Sometimes the shafts need to be inspected in the factory. That yep. just depends on the AHJ. They look at our welding and our drywall because that's really all we do building code wise. But we do a lot of in-plant inspections. We have inspectors come in and do that. So here I am. I am an architect. I'm a general contractor. And I say, all right, I watched Allison on this Dave Cooper live show. How do I work with Allison? Like, tell me the process. I got a project. When do you like to get involved? Uh, and my guess is you're going to say you're in the beginning, but when do you like to get involved? Walk me through how do I work with you or how do I recommend you if I'm a general contractor to the architect, vice versa? Well, the sooner the better, just because there are some differences in drawing your plans around a modular elevator than around a stick built elevator. Um, just as one example, we have a structure that goes down in the pit and bolts to it. There's pit walls outside of that. Stick built elevators have pit walls that become the hoistway walls. And so just knowing things like that, we can help you from the start so you don't have to do a lot of rework. I, we'll go through the design. I talked a little bit about that before. We'll go through your plans and your prints and say, hey, you've got these doors right here. How are you going to do this? Which side do you want the hall stations on? Because you've got this wall right here. What are you going to do about it? So we really work through and give a lot of hand-holding design assistance, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And, and do you guys... Uh... Do you guys use a like an AutoCAD file? Do you use Revit? Like, what do you guys use for design? Yeah, we use AutoCAD, um, and we can do three D designs as well, and provide those so they can drop them into their into their BIM. Yeah, for sure. Allison, is there anything that I did not bring up? As I'm thinking in my head, and it's spinning in a million different directions, that you really want people to know. Is there anything that I missed? Well, you didn't really talk about why these are better. I mean, they're obviously cool. <laughs> but the, you got the, me. The yes. value position really is it's a shorter lead time than stick built construction. It's a faster install. Um, those four traction elevators, we got power live five weeks before the building was turned over. And there is not an elevator company out there that could stick built four nine stop traction elevators in five weeks. And that's why they hired us for that job. So it's a, it's a shorter install, faster to yeah. get it up. It's a self-supporting structure. And so there's not a lot of injury. If you're putting it, if you're adding it to a building, you don't have to do anything internally to, to make, make it work for the elevator. You don't have to build that shaft. We can put it on the outside or drop it in the middle. Right. Take care of that. We also use non-proprietary equipment. Um, that's another big advantage from the majors. We like to use their controllers that they then won't sell you the software to program and maintain. So then you're locked into doing maintenance with them. So that's a, a huge benefit to the equipment that we use. Oh, got it. Got it. So they can pick whatever control system that they want. Is that what I'm hearing? Or does that mean? Well, typically customers don't know to ask about the systems. And so okay. Otis or Kone, they get Otis or Kone's controller. And then when they go to bid out their maintenance after the warranty period is done, nobody else will take care of it because you have to have right. their special software to, to program things. So we just take take care of that. I mean, Otis can take care of our elevators. It doesn't matter. Anybody can, because anybody can find the spare yeah. parts and do the programming. So time saving, right? There's several things you mentioned there, right? You're faster, you're more accurate, the time savings. I'm sure there's insurance and liability savings without having a bunch of people crawling through elevator shafts uh, to put things together. Yeah. How, how fast? Tell me, tell me, tell me how much time are we saving doing it this way? Because just like modular, it's being built while everything else is being built and it's ready to go when it's ready to go. We can build the whole thing in a single piece tower in three to four weeks in our factory. Um, so because we're building the cab separately than the shaft, we're doing our own little like modular offsite thing. And then meanwhile, the, the site work is being done and we're dropping it in. Once an elevator is delivered, if it's a hydraulic elevator, um, we can drop it in. And if we've got power a week later, we're ready for inspection. Wow. So again, there's a big time savings here. And when you get into residential, hospitals, commercial, it's all about time to open, heads on beds, all of those things. And you're helping uh, you're helping the investor or the developer, whoever it is, get there quicker. Yep. Love Absolutely. it. With, with less risk of somebody being hurt too. 
Let's go to a comment here. Actually, let's do a couple comments. Uh, Greg Ugaldi says, fascinating option, DC Live. Allison, do you provide the team uh, on-site for installation? He wants to know, what do you provide for on-site installation? Absolutely. We we either subcontract the install to installers that have done stuff before with us, um, or we self-perform. We self-perform about 80% of our non-California installs. So it'll be our guys that are there putting it in and making sure it happens right. Excellent. Thank you, Greg Ugaldi, immediate past chair of the NAHB. Big player. You got to know him, Allison. It's awesome you joined us today. All right, Henry Mickelberg. With a steel frame, I always aim to make the elevator shaft structure an integral structural part of the overall steel frame. So as not to double up steel, is this something you consider? Are you talking about using the elevator as shear, as a shear wall? I always aim to make the elevator shaft structure an integral structural part of the overall steel frame. Yeah, that's what I would take it as. Are you looking to use the shaft as part of the structural strength? So we can't... Yeah two kind of two ways to answer that depends if it's shear or lateral load so we've done things like you want to put your floor joists and hang them off of our shaft and we can do that to support it so it butts right up and you don't have that additional wall um shear is a little a little bit different but if you've got a specific project we'd be happy to talk to you about how we might be able to do that excellent excellent and talk to us about the territory that you serve how, how far west north east south across the country across the globe can we go with Phoenix? 50 states and I wish, okay, I'm embarrassed. I don't know how many Canadian provinces there are. Um, a not, lot. We'll just say a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. All of them. Um, no, we've talked to a few, like ones where you have to get there by boats. Um, we haven't yeah. delivered that far away yet or that, that remote. Um, U.S. equipment is built to American codes. Europeans have a different code standard, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for Europe. We'd have to get different equipment, source it from yep. China and long lead times and shipping them on boats and things like that. So North America. North America. Where's where's the best place for people to learn more about the company? We have a website, phoenixmodularelevator.com. And you can call us too. Uh, we have fantastic sales consultants that will answer their phones. We don't have auto attendants. They will answer your questions, um, look at your drawings, help you configure what you need to know, give you some pretty, pretty fast budget pricing. You're just kicking tires. And really be really helpful in figuring out. Excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, I can't wait to actually get out to your factory one of these days and on a job site and showcase uh, how this is going and talk to the people that are using your system, right? Because that's that's the key to all of this. When you have people like DPR and we know Ray Boff and some of the others out there, um, I mean, if they're using your system, that says a whole lot. So super excited to have you on the show, Allison. All right, I'm going to ask again Did I miss something? Did I cover everything? Oh man, I could talk for hours, but I won't. I won't hold you hostage for that. But we you love to come out for our uh, yeah. Come out and we can do a plant tour, or we'll let you know when there's an install in your area. You come and watch the magic of the elevator turning turning upright. Yeah, like, I I definitely want to see it. And for those of you who commented out there, I saw Kirsten's name was just up there. Said such an informative conversation, and the visuals were helpful to grasp the information. Thank you for sharing. Well, thank you as well, Kirsten, for joining us today. And by the way, there are so many others out there. Vince Grassi's out there, ZF. I don't even know who ZF official is, but uh, Allison, you have uh, quite a large fan base out there. So uh, it's awesome to see so many people interested in this topic. And I wish you and Phoenix and your team uh, all the success in the world. And I look forward to following what you guys are doing in the future. Thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Awesome. So don't go anywhere. We'll come back to you after this word from our sponsors and the rest of you out there. It's Monday. That's right. You got four and a half days to build it better. I'm Dave Cooper. Thanks for watching. What an amazing show. Thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us to continue to bring all of these innovative conversations to all of you out there. Please visit them, see what they have to offer you. And as always, subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring that bell. It would mean the world to us. I'm Dave Cooper. Thanks for watching.